Good morning, and welcome to WC's March Educational Webinar entitled Out of Order, Parliamentary Procedure Basics for Effective and Efficient Meetings. My name is Sarah Deidre Castor, and I will be moderating this morning's session. Uh, my comments this morning uh, will be brief as I want to make sure that we have plenty of time for the presentation and for Q&A. The one thing I will say is I, I always get really excited when we talk about parliamentary procedure, and I know that probably puts me into the nerd category, but there are so many topics and things we could be discussing with regard to county board rules, Robert's rules of order, parliamentary procedure, that we could probably hold this webinar on a monthly basis and never run out of topics to talk about. Um, so I hope you, you uh, learn a lot uh, as part of today's webinar. Um, before I introduce our presenter, I just wanna do, make a quick note with regard to Q&A and how Q&A will be handled today. Uh, you will see on the bottom of your screen, there is a chat function as well as a Q&A function. Uh, whichever one is easier for you to use, please click on it and feel free to type in your questions or comments or observations during the meeting and we will be monitoring the chat and Q&A function throughout. If a question pops up that we think needs to be addressed immediately, we will ask Andy to address it at this, that time. Uh, but now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter for this morning's uh, webinar, Andy Phillips. Many of you know Andy. Andy has dedicated his career to assisting governmental and quasi-governmental entities with their most challenging legal problems. Andy brings innovative solutions to the organizational, operational, and personnel problems facing local governments and has been a leader in creating entities to serve areas such as Medicaid programming, public finance, human services, and long-term care. No, Andy, I can see the look on your face. I'm not going to read your full long bio. I was uh, waiting for it. I wonder how much like time me. you're going to take up. No, you're like me. I cut. Hate, cut. Yep. I hate it when people read my bio. Here's what I will say. Most of you already know Andy. Andy's our go-to guy on all things affecting counties. So I think we'll go to Andy now to learn what to do and not to do when we are in meetings. Take Thanks, it away, Sarah. Andy. Thanks, Sarah, and happy Monday, everybody. Good morning. Um, this is the basic session. It's parliamentary procedure basics. I took a course in college. It was actually two credits. It wasn't three credits. So it was not the regular course schedule, but it was at least two credits dedicated to parliamentary procedure. And I know just enough to be dangerous when it comes to parliamentary procedure. There are plenty of people out there that know more than me. There are plenty of people out there that know less than me. And I think that puts us all in the same bucket. And that is, all right, do we know enough about parliamentary procedure to run an effective meeting? Because that's what parliamentary procedure is all about. So we're gonna cover some basics today. We're not gonna dive into detail on some obscure question on chapter three, page 24 of Robert's Rules, because just like everybody else, I would have to get out this really thick book here and I'd have to look it up. So let's have a common understanding of what parliamentary procedure is, how we use it, what it does. And then if we get into some detailed questions, as Sarah said, the Q&A and the chat function are there. Feel free to ask away and the, we'll do the best we can to answer those questions. So as we start here with parliamentary procedure on the basics, um, you know, I always find the best humor has a grain of truth in it. And that's the definition of good humor. It's got a grain of truth. And this is a really sarcastic piece that came out years and years ago talking about meetings. Are you lonely, tired of working on your own? Do you hate making decisions? Well, hold a meeting. You can see people, draw org charts, feel important, impress your colleagues, eat donuts, all on company or county time. Meetings, the practical alternative to work. Why is that funny? Because it's true. And so how do we take this aspect of meetings or this view of meetings and turn it on its head and say, how do we hold a productive meeting? How do we get things done? How do we advance our interests? in the context of a meeting. Well, one of the ways that we do that is to have a strong foundation built upon solid parliamentary procedure principles. All right, so setting the stage, running effective meetings. I think it's always important to set the stage. Whenever I'm dealing with a legal question, when I'm dealing with some interpretation of a statute, I always ask the question, why? Why would it say this? Why would something like this exist? So let me ask the question, why does parliamentary procedure exists? Where, where, where did it come from and what is its intended purpose here? Well, we have to understand that Robert's Rules of Order is not the supreme law of the land. 
We have state statutes, we have local ordinances and board rules, and then we have Robert's Rules of Order. And Robert's Rules actually recognizes that. Uh, Robert's Rules does not trump, for example, Wisconsin's open meetings law. You have to comply with Wisconsin's open meetings law, and it doesn't matter what Robert says. And the same goes for a local ordinance or a board rule. If you've codified something in ordinance that relates to meeting procedure, that's going to take precedence over Robert's rules of order. So think of Robert's rules of order as the gap filler. In the absence of a state statute, in the absence of a local ordinance or a board rule, Robert's rules of order are going to govern the procedure associated with a particular question in a meeting. So what is the purpose? What is the foundation? Why do rules of order exist? Very simply, facilitate the smooth functioning of the assembly. It provides a common set of rules that we've all agreed on that we are going to operate under. It resolves questions of procedure so we don't get into endless debates about the propriety of a particular procedure. We can actually get to the very important business that is proceeding before the board or the committee. It provides organizational stability. We all have an understanding of exactly how the organization is going to operate. And then it's important here too, is that when we're talking about board rules, when we're talking about local ordinances that may create those board rules, we wanna make sure that we adopt the latest edition of the Roberts Rules of Order newly revised. That would be the 12th edition. 12th edition came out last, came out last year, I believe. Um, and so, in your board rules, in your ordinances, if you're going to adopt Robert's Rules of Order, which you should, and I think that for the most part, every county has, you wanna just put in there, we're going to proceed according to the latest edition of Robert's Rules of Order, newly revised. So what's the history of parliamentary procedure? What does this mean? Well, parliamentary law was originally the name given to the rules and customs for carrying on business in the English parliament. Um, and I will tell you, and this gets a little bit into the weeds, but parliamentary law is a lot like the rest of the law. And when I say that, I mean, we have this concept in the legal world known as common law. Well, what is common law? Well, for lack of a better term, that means just the way things have always been done. And there's this concept in the law called stare decisis, which means the law of the decision or as the decision stands. And stare decisis is used as a legal principle to say that we are not going to deviate from the way we've addressed a question previously. We're going to be consistent in our application of the rules. The same goes for parliamentary law. Prior to Robert's rules of order, you would look back and see how have we resolved this type of a question previously. And we're going to conduct ourselves now in a manner consistent with the way that we've pre previously conducted ourselves. And so when we talk about parliamentary law, it's based on, again, rules and customs that have persisted throughout history. Understand too, that when we're talking about parliamentary law, this concept of a deliberative assembly, that's the meeting, the body, the entity that uh, applies these parliamentary principles. And that's where the business gets done. So who is Henry Robert? We call him Robert's Rules. Henry Robert, he lived from 1837 to 1923. You don't need to know all this history to understand what Robert's Rules are about. But again, I think it's interesting because we look at the source of Robert's Rules of Order. Number one, we had an individual that was asked to preside over a church meeting and it went horribly. All right. And if any of you have been in a church or a church committee meeting, you know those can run on for hours and hours and hours. I was a member of a Presbyterian church and a member of the Board of Elders, Elders at that Presbyterian church. And we love to meet as all Presbyterians do. And those meetings can go on forever. And so Henry Robert was asked to preside over one of these meetings. It went terrible. And he said, I'm not gonna do it again unless we've got some rules that are gonna govern how we get together and decide what business is going to be conducted. So that was number one. Number two, he was stationed in Milwaukee for an engineering project and there was a very, very bad winter. So for the, remember this is 1837, 1923 that he lived. So back in those days, he didn't have the ability to uh, watch cable TV or dial up the internet. So he said, you know what? I'm gonna write a manuscript that deals with these rules of procedure. So you can thank Wisconsin, thank Milwaukee for Robert's rules because without that severe winter, don't know if we'd ever have them. So here are the principles that are underlying parliamentary law. And all of these principles underlie Robert's rules of order. All right, the rules are based on a regard for the rights of, and then there are five categories. 
Number one, majority. The majority rules. That is the fundamental principle of Robert's rules. If you're not in the majority and you lose a question, the majority rules in most circumstances. We also, though, recognize that the min minority has certain rights and privileges, especially a strong minority. So, for example, when it comes to debates uh, and when it comes to um, making certain privilege motions and things like that, we're going to recognize that even though you may not be in the majority, you still have the right to get the question before that deliberative assembly to try to have the matter resolved. We're going to recognize the rights of individual members. There are certain privileged and incidental motions that impact individual members of the deliberative assembly. And we're going to recognize that those individual members have certain rights to make motions or raise questions. We're going to recognize and provide for the rights of those who aren't at the meeting. And so we're going to talk about exactly how somebody who's not at the meeting nonetheless has certain rights related to notice of the meetings, perhaps the opportunity to dial into a meeting, perhaps the opportunity to vote by proxy. I understand that in counties, we don't have a concept of voting by proxy. Again, I'm just going based upon Robert's rules, which were not designed for the public sector. But again, there is mention in Robert's rules about this concept of proxy. And then you wrap all of these together. And how do you blend all of these different rights, all of these different privileges, recognize all of them and put them into a comprehensive set of rules. So let's start with a very fundamental principle. In simple terms, how do I get business before the body? Well, it's an eight step process, okay? And this is when we're dealing with the actual business before the body. We've gotten through roll call, we've approved the agenda, we've approved the minutes from the last meeting, now we're on to the point of the agenda where we want business to come before the body. Eight step process. And we're gonna talk about each of these eight steps. But if you think about the eight step process and you take a look at these boxes, you can conceptualize exactly who has what role, when and in what context going through these eight different steps. And so I really like this chart and I think Sarah put together this chart. I stole it because I think it's a fantastic chart to kind of describe how it is that business proceeds before a county board or a county committee. First, you have to obtain the floor. You have to raise your hand, you have to stand, you have to push a button. Does Robert's rules talk about exactly how you obtain the floor? It discusses this concept, but ultimately it's left to the custom associated with a particular county board. I know that I think a majority of county boards now have a system where a button is pressed so that the chair of the board has the opportunity to look, see whose button is pressed, and then recognize the individual pressing the button to obtain the floor. You don't have the opportunity to just interrupt, stand up, shout out, and say, I want the floor. That's, that's not a concept that's recognized in Robert's rules and that would be out of order. You have to be recognized by the presiding officer, the chair of the county board, the chair of the committee. It's only after the presiding officer recognizes you that you have the ability then to address the body. When you're authorized to speak, you are said to have the floor. That's parliamentary parlance for you're authorized to speak and address the body. So you got the floor, chairs recognized you, you wanna make a motion, all right? A motion is a proposal by a member in a meeting that the group takes certain actions. So think of it like you're, it's an invitation out there saying, I suggest that we do X and you're asking the body to actually adopt a formal position as it relates to X so that the body then is obligated to move in that fashion. So you make that motion. Now. The motion brings the business before the body. And the third bullet point is really important here. There should be no debate on a matter before a motion has been made. Not only should there be no debate, but in my estimation, there should be no introductory discussion about what the motion is. So in other words, let's say that the chair, I, I wanna make a motion. Chair recognizes me, I have the floor. I wanna make a motion that the county purchase 15 police cars for the sheriff's office. And so I say, as everybody knows, we have a shortage of police cars. And I was talking to my neighbor the other day and the neighbor indicated to me that she never sees the sheriff's cars anywhere in the county. When I'll tell you right now, that's because we don't have enough cars. You shouldn't start by 
having that speech. You should start by saying, I move that the county purchase 15 new police cars for the sheriff's office. It's only after that motion, and we'll get into this, it's only after that motion is seconded and it's before the body, then do you have an opportunity to explain why, okay? So again, you want to get the matter before the body, before we begin debate, before we begin speeches, before we begin explanations. One of the fundamental principles, and this is the fourth bullet point on this slide, one of the fundamental principles in parliamentary procedure is that only one matter belongs before the body at any given time. You have to dispose of the thing in front of you before you move on to the next thing. Now, there are circumstances where certain motions take precedence over the business pending before the body. And we'll get into that in a bit. But you still have to take care of whatever is before the body before you move on to the next question. So you made the motion. I move that, the example that the, I, I provided earlier, I move that the county purchase 15 new police cars for the sheriff's office. Describe the proposal. Clearly describe what it is you're asking the body to do. Avoid negative motions because negative motions just lead to confusion when the chair restates the motion. It leads to confusion when you go to vote. Well, what does a yes vote mean? Does a yes vote mean that I disagree or I agree? What does it mean? So avoid negative motions. Always make those positive motions. I hear this all the time, so moved. And it's, it's expedient. It's a way to move things on. It's some member makes some sort of comment about, yeah, we really need new police cars. I think that the county ought to purchase 15 new police cars for the sheriff's office. And some other member will say, so moved. Is that an appropriate motion? No, that's, that's not an appropriate motion. Robert's Rules of Order would not recognize that. So let's make it clean. Let's have an understanding of exactly what the motion is so that the body knows what they're debating and so the body knows what they're going to vote on. So let's take our time, be deliberate, and make sure that we're clear. So once the motion is made by a member, it then gets seconded. It's seconded by somebody else, not the same person who made the motion. It shows that there is some sort of support for whatever business the maker of the motion wants to get before the assembly. That's why we have this process of it being seconded. When you second a motion, you don't have to have be recognized by the chair. Unlike making the motion where the chair has to recognize you before you obtain the floor, you can just shout out second and that's fine. Now again, in most counties that, that I've seen, we want to record who made the motion and who seconded it. So there is opportunity for the clerk to write down who seconded the motion. But under Robert's rules, we don't care that we record exactly who seconded it. All we want to know is that a second was made. And as long as a second is made, we know that again, whatever business the maker of the motion wants before the assembly is worthy of support, it has support, it's worthy of debate, and it needs to be put in front of the floor. This is another step that I think uh, many times it's, it's missed. And this is a very important step in my estimation. Here's why it's important. Once the maker of the motion makes the motion, it's seconded, it goes before the body. Instead of the chair saying, okay, I'm gonna open the floor to, for debate, I think the chair ought to take opportunity, and this is where the chair ought to be a good note taker, the chair needs to take the opportunity to restate the motion and needs to say exactly to the body what it is that the motion will do, okay? It's not an explanation of the motion or anything like that. It's restating the question to make sure that it's clear. That's an opportunity for the maker of the motion to either agree or disagree with how this is worded by the chair. And let's face it, sometimes some of these motions can be a bit complicated. So there may be opportunity for the maker of the motion to say, that's not what I meant at all. And so again, I think it's very important that the chair restate the question. It's been moved and seconded that the county purchased 15 police cars for the sheriff's office. All right, that's the question, boom, it's out there. In order, according to Robert's rules, according for the motion to be considered by the assembly, the chair has to restate the question. And then this third bullet point is again, it's important when we're thinking about that concept of the eight boxes as we go through the process. Whose motion is this? Well, when the maker makes the motion, it is the maker's motion, all right? 
When the individual seconds the motion, ownership transfers to the chair. The chair restates the question. Once the question has been restated, the motion belongs to the body, all right? So it's the body's motion. It's not the maker's motion. It's not the seconder's motion. It's not the chair's motion. It is the body's motion. And that's important when we get into concepts related to how we amend motions and what we do. And we'll get into that in a moment. But understand that, again, as you move through, the, through those eight boxes that I talked about earlier, understand whose motion is it, okay? Once it becomes the body's motion, we want to debate it. We want to discuss it. We want to ask questions, all right? The motion is said to be on the floor. Discussion on the merits, whether the proposed action should or should not be taken. Typically, the maker is the mo of the motions assigned the floor first. So when we're... Remember earlier, I had indicated that we don't precede our motion with some long explanation as to why we think it's a good idea that the body takes certain action. Well, that's because the maker of the motion is given first opportunity to speak to the merits of the question. And so motions made, motion seconded, chair restates, it's the body's motion. Chair first recognizes the maker of the motion. Supervisor Phillips, do you have anything further to say on your proposal that the county purchase 15 police cars? Yes, Mr. Chair, I'd like to talk about this a little bit. I was talking to my neighbor the other day and my neighbor said that there were, she has never seen any car, any sheriff's office car throughout the entire county. And that's when you go into your explanation. So again, the maker's given the floor first. Typically under Robert's rules, no member can speak more than twice on any motion, okay? When we talk about the rules of debate, again, it's covered in detail in Robert's Rules of Order, but person cannot speak more than twice and as long as is given the opportunity to speak first. According to Robert's Rules, you can't speak more than 10 minutes each time. And there is no concept in Robert's Rules about yielding unused or saved times. Now, can you have a local rule that talks about unused or saved time and things like that? Sure, you can always have a local rule that deals with that. We're talking about, again, the foundational principles of Robert's rules. There is no concept of yielding unused time or saving time. The other thing that you're not gonna find in Robert's rules is this concept of filibuster. Do you have the ability under Robert's rules to get up and start reading out of the phone book for two and a half hours in an effort to try to kill a particular proposal before the county board? No. Robert's rules would say that's out of order. And you're gonna say, well, what about the Congress? They do that stuff all the time. They do, they have their own rules relating to filibuster and cloture and all of that stuff. Understand that none of that is in Robert's rules. That's based upon Congress's internal procedures relating to deliberation, okay? So when we're dealing with a county board meeting, we have no ability to yield unused time, save time, things like that, unless it's provided in local rule. And we have no ability to filibuster, again, unless it's provided and local rule. So the remarks must be germane. This gets back to the whole phone book thing I just discussed, they, meaning that your commentary has to be germane or relevant to the particular motion before the deliberative assembly. The presiding officer, the chair, shouldn't interrupt because he or she believes they know more about the particular matter than the speaker. The presiding officer has no rights or privileges greater than the body itself, greater than any member of the body. The presiding officer is there to act as a shepherd to make sure that the particular process is followed to get a matter before the county board or the committee in a, in a, in a logical manner. But again, the presiding officer, the chair has no right to interrupt just because they think they might know more. Typically under Robert's rules, if the presiding officer is going to engage in debate, in other words, express an opinion as it relates to the particular business that is proposed before the assembly, the, pres the presiding officer must step down. All right, that's in Robert's rules. Now, we run into a little bit of a conflict here with counties because the presiding officer has been elected to the Board of Supervisors from a district and has a responsibility to represent the electors that put him or her in office. And so I always say it's kind of a, it's a rule of thumb because honestly, you want the presiding officer to represent his or her constituents, but at the same time, you don't want the presiding officer to start calling into question impartiality when it comes to the rules of procedure. 
In other words, there is a way as a presiding officer to line up the yes mo no votes and the no votes to try to influence some of the maybes. You don't want that question out there. And so if it is gonna be a particularly contentious issue and the presiding officer has some sort of unique knowledge or information that is going to be relevant to debate, I always say it's a good practice for the presiding officer, the chair, to hand the gavel to the vice chair and say, I'd like you to preside over this debate because I'm gonna have a lot to say as to this particular motion. But if the presiding officer's interests are in common or very similar to the balance of the body, then I see no problem with the presiding officer making a couple of comments here or there. And I understand that's not in Robert's rules. Robert's rules says you got to step down. But I also understand the reality that county board chairs are elected to office by constituents and he or she has a responsibility to those constituents. It's a rule of thumb. It's whatever custom, if you need to codify it in your local rules, codify it, but you kind of got to go with what smells right in a particular circumstance. Now, the maker of the motion it can vote against that motion, but not allowed to speak against his or her own motion. That's important too. You're not bound as the maker of the motion to vote for your own motion, but you can't make a motion then immediately get up and start talking about how bad a motion it is. All right. That's again in Robert's rules. Avoid personality conflicts, avoid questioning the motives of another member, avoid personal attacks, always direct your comments through the chair and, at, and think about the chair being the body. So you want your comments to be the entire body. You don't want to address a particular member and you certainly don't want to get into character attacks. Now, as you're going through the debate on a particular question, you can make amendments to the original main motion, but remember it's two at a time. And remember this whole concept that we deal with one thing at a time as a deliberative assembly. And so if I make the motion that we purchase 15 police cars for the sheriff's office, somebody may, might make an amendment and say, I move to amend the original main motion and we that we purchase 13 police cars instead of 15. If there is a second to that amendment, you have to deal with that amendment before you go back to the original main motion. And so then you debate whether you should purchase 13 cars. And if the body says, we're going to purchase 13 cars instead of 15, then that amendment is made. But then you still have to vote on the original main motion because the original main motion is amended by striking 15 and inserting 13, all right? So again, if you think about it like a ladder, you go two steps down on the amendment and then you go, got to go back up the ladder to take care of that original main motion, all right? There are only two amendments at a time. You can't, you can amend amendment, but you cannot amend an amendment to an amendment, if that makes sense. It's only two at a time. And then there's this concept within Robert's rules talking about the settled rule. Has the issue under consideration been resolved? You can't just modify a period, a comma, a semicolon, two words and say, well, it's a brand new amendment. It's a brand new motion. No, if you've disposed of it, it's, if it's within the topical area and you've already, the, the body has already decided exactly what, you're, what direction you're going to go, you can't keep introducing these amendments that have the same effect as the amendment that was defeated. So, and it's, again, a matter of discretion. That's up to the chair and the parliamentarian to determine whether application of the settle rule is appropriate in any particular circumstance. Once the debate is done, we put the question to the body. So what does it mean to put the question? What it means is, is again, let's think about this as to who owns the motion. Well, the body owns the motion. It's there, we're debating it. Once debate is done, the chair looks around, no more buttons pressed, no more hands in the air, no more members rising to talk to the, to the question before the body. At that point, we know that we're going to go to a vote, okay? I think that the chair ought to ask, is there any further debate on this motion? As long as somebody says, yeah, I want to, I want to speak to it again. And as long as that person hasn't already spoken twice or otherwise used his or her allotted time, we allow that person to speak again. But let's assume the chair says, okay, is there any further debate? Hearing nothing? Okay, now we're going to put the question to a vote. Repeat the motion. And the motion should be worded exactly as how the chair stated the motion when the chair provided the motion to the body. So we restate the question. There may be circumstance for the chair, and think about this again, if the chair is the shepherd making sure that we follow procedure, the chair may have opportunity to explain what a yes vote means and explain what a no vote means. Remember earlier I said there might be complicated things that come before the county board and we should avoid putting motions in a negative way. Well, there may be opportunity where we have a complicated motion and the chair says, just so we're clear, a yes vote means that we are going to purchase 
15 police cars for the sheriff's office. A no vote means we're going to purchase zero cars for the sheriff's office. Any questions? Okay, let's proceed to a vote, okay? Understand too, the chair is going is in charge of determining whether we need a simple majority vote, whether we need a two thirds vote. There may be circumstances, for example, if we are engaging in bond financing where we need a three quarter vote, um, we may need a three quarter vote of the entire board, everybody entitled to a seat, not just the members that are there. And so again, the chair explains the motion and says we need a two thirds or a three quarter vote or a simple majority vote for passage, explains all of those things, again, so that the body is aware of the consequences of the vote they are, they are about to cast, all right? And then the chair says, all in favor, vote aye. Those opposed say no. You ask, always ask for yay or nay votes. You don't just simply say, uh, all those in favor say aye. It sounds like everybody said aye, so it sounds like the ayes have it. No, you always ask for the no votes. It's just go through that process. So in the absence of a circumstance where the chair declares debate done. In other words, the chair says any further debate, doesn't see anybody and says, I declare the debate is done. We're gonna put the question. Members have the opportunity to end debate. And you hear this all the time in meetings. I hear it all the time in meetings is that somebody will shout out, call the question. That's out of order. A member can't simply shout out, I call the question. Rather, the member has to obtain the floor and then move the previous question, all right? So when we want to end debate, a member has the opportunity to end debate, can get recognized by the chair and ask the chair, I move the previous question. That requires a second, it requires a two thirds vote to pass, all right? But, and here's a very important point. If I'm chairing a meeting and I see that there are all sorts of buttons pressed with members wanting to discuss the particular question before the body, I recognize somebody and that somebody says, I move the previous question. I'm gonna call that out of order. I'm gonna say, we've got all sorts of folks that wanna debate. It's not, it's not right or fair to move the previous question. Now, when is it right or fair to move the previous question when there are people that wanna debate? Well, if it's a particular issue that has been, I mean, the, the phrase is beating a dead horse, this discussion has gone on forever and we are not moving the ball forward. At that point, it may be appropriate for somebody to move the previous question. It may be appropriate for the chair to recognize that motion in or get a second. And if two thirds of the deliberative assembly, the county board say, yeah, I wanna end debate, then you can have that vote and you can move on to the actual vote on the question before the assembly. Votes can be taken in a variety of ways. Step seven is voting. Typically we have roll call in county board meetings and committees, we don't have roll call. You can ask for eyes, you can ask for no's. There are different ways to vote and, and Robert's Rules recognizes all those ways. Now, there is opportunity for a member to demand a roll call vote, even if it's been taken on voice vote. So chair says all in favor say aye, those opposed say nay, the ayes have it, motion carries. Somebody may raise their hand and demand a, demand a count of those votes, a showing of the hands. Also, before a vote is taken, a member may ask for a roll call vote, in which case we go through the roll and we call the roll and, and we ask everybody how they're going to vote on a particular topic. Now, I know that in many, many county board rooms, we've got a screen that shows how a particular member voted, it's electronic voting. And so in that circumstance, it serves as both a roll call vote and it also shows how a particular person voted. That's, that's fine. So in other words, I don't think it would be appropriate for somebody to demand a roll call vote when we have electronic voting showing how everybody is voting on a particular motion. In other words, that'd be out of order. We already have roll call. We already know how each particular supervisor voted and we're recording how they voted on the screen and in our system. So keep that in mind that individual members, remember I said that individual members have certain rights. This is one of the rights that individual members have is to demand a roll call and a showing of the hands on, it's called division of the assembly if we don't have clarity as to exactly how everybody voted on a voice vote. After the vote happens, the presiding officer announces the results. Motion carried or failed. If known, the number of votes on each side. Again, when we have electronic voting, we know exactly what that looks like. And then this is important too. What is the effect or impact of the motion being carried or denied or declined? We want to say to the body, okay, on the motion for us to purchase, for the county to purchase 15 police cars for the sheriff's office, the motion carried 30 to 1. 
that means that we are going to purchase 15 police cars. And then you move on to the next item of business on the agenda. Andy, I think this would be a good place to stop. We do have some questions related specifically to some of the things that you talked about. Um, there are other questions that, that we did receive and I want folks to know I, I, I see them. They're a little bit off topic, so I'd rather take those at the end. But Andy, there's a few questions I think would be appropriate now. Uh, one of the questions we have is who is generally responsible for enforcing the rules of the county? Um, you know, who typically serves at, as the parliamentarian at the county level? Sir, let me ask you, who's in charge of the meeting? The county board chair. Thank you, the chair. It's whoever's chairing the meeting is in charge of the meeting. And the chair has the opportunity under Robert's rules to appoint people to assist in keeping decorum at a particular meeting. Now, you've probably heard if you've attended these parliamentary procedure discussions previously, Mike Blaska, who is formerly with the county's association and right now he's retired living his dream life on the East Coast. But he always talked about this concept of a sergeant at arms being a recognized officer within a county. And the sergeant at arms sole responsibility was to maintain decorum and otherwise enforce the rules of procedure of the county and of the board chair during a meeting. Now, is that necessary? No, it's not necessary. But if you have particular issues, it might be good to have a sergeant at arms recognized as being there to help enforce the rules of procedure as it relates to a board meeting. Now, the question of who's the parliamentarian, again, it's the chair under Robert's rules, but you can also have a designated parliamentarian. I know many counties have designated corporation council as parliamentarian, and that's awesome. That's great. You have the corporation council sitting up next to the board chair at the meeting, and if questions of procedure come up, that's opportunity for the chair to confer with corporation council as to the appropriate application of your county board rules, your local ordinances, state statute, or Robert's rules of order. Here's the important thing to remember though, is that ultimately it is the chair's decision, not the parliamentarian's decision. There is no opportunity for the, for the body to try to overrule the decision of the parliamentarian because there's no such thing. It's the rule of the chair. And so what I always say is on some of these complicated questions and some of these issues come up, take your time, try to get it right. I don't think there's any chair out there that wants to be wrong. So let's take our time. Let's sit down with corporation council, get out the book, go through the book, understand it. Parliamentarian explains to the chair exactly how the rule needs to be applied. Chair says to the body, here's how the rule is going to be applied and move on. If the body disagrees, if the body says, that's not what Robert's rules means, that's not what it said, that's not how you interpret this, you have the opportunity to overrule the ruling by the board chair as the application of those procedural rules. And if the majority of the body agrees with overruling the chair, the chair is overruled. So again, the chair makes those decisions, confers with the parliamentarian, announces the result. If the body disagrees, they can overrule the ruling of the chair. All right, another question for you, Andy. After voting on an amendment, why do you have to vote on the original motion? Well, because there might be people who support the particular amendment, but don't support the original motion. And so take, for example, my example with 15 police cars. Amendment made to strike 15 and take it down to seven, all right? So if I'm sitting there saying, well, I don't think we should buy any police cars, but seven is a heck of a lot better than, than 15. So I'm gonna vote yes for seven, but on the original motion, I don't think we should buy any. So I definitely want it from 15 to seven, but I also want it from seven to zero. So I'm gonna vote on the amendment. I'm gonna vote yes to get us down to seven, and, but then I'm gonna vote no on the original main motion because I don't think we should buy any. That's an example. All right, we'll do two more questions, then let you go on and we'll get to the rest of the questions after. So the first of the two, are you able to debate again after already holding the vote? No, if, the, if remember what's before the body. If, if the matter is appropriately before the body, you're engaged in debate about the matter that's before the body. Once the body doesn't own the particular piece of business that's before it because it's disposed of the question, you have no right to debate anything. All right, and then the last one before we let you move on. When a resolution has a motion and second, can a board member make an amendment to completely throw out the resolution on the floor and replace with an entirely new version? If so, what is the language for the motion to amend? 
I would say no, but I mean, again, we're getting into some of the gray area here and, and talking about what does it mean to completely overthrow it and change the entire character of the particular motion. An amendment under Robert's rules cannot change the character of the original main motion. And so it would be out of order, for example, in my, in my circumstance to say, I move that the county purchase 15 police cars for the sheriff's office. If somebody said, I move to amend the original main motion to state that I move we purchase uh, 12 new cars for the human services department. That's complete, a completely different question than the question before the body purchasing police cars for the sheriff's office, all right? And it would be out of order to make that amendment. So it has to be, the amendment has to relate to the original main motion, if that makes sense. All right, so we're gonna move on to rules of decorum and debate. Before we do that, I want to point out that there is a lot going on behind the scenes, even as we're debating and discussing an original main motion before the assembly, and we're going through those eight different boxes that I talked about earlier. Robert's Rules is chock full of all sorts of procedural mechanisms related to what we do with a particular question. All right, there's a reason when you look at this book that it's so thick. There are all sorts of different motions in there, and it gets confusing. Let's start with this number one principle. Parliamentary procedure is designed to be a shield, not a sword. What do I mean by that? You might have an individual on the county board who's particularly well versed in parliamentary procedure and Robert's rules that is just going to be an obstructionist, is just gonna start throwing things out there. Number one, that's not appropriate. That's not appropriate use of procedural rules. But number two, that speaks to my concept earlier about the chair and the parliamentarian taking time to make the right procedural determinations. Now, what is helpful, I've found, is for every board supervisor to have a chart like this. I'm holding it up, and I know that it's small print. It's a chart that Robert Rules has put out. And I'm going to ask Michelle or Anne-Marie or Sarah to post into the chat right now the link that I provided earlier to this chart. It's called the Order of Precedence on the Motions chart, and it goes through and it will tell you exactly what type of motion you are supposed to make in a particular circumstance when it is going to be in order, whether it needs to be seconded to be considered, whether it takes precedence over other motions and what type of vote is necessary for the motion to pass. It's important that everybody have that. So if somebody somehow brings up, makes a motion, um, I appeal from the decision of the chair. Well, wait a minute, what, is, what does that mean? We just disposed of the question, the chair just announced the result and somebody's appealing the decision of the chair. What does that mean? Well, if you got the chart, you break it out and you say, oh, okay. So can you interrupt somebody? Yeah, you can interrupt somebody. Does it need a second? Yeah, it needs a second. Do we have a debate on this? Well, maybe it kind of depends on the circumstances. Can you amend that particular motion? No. And a majority vote is all that is necessary to appeal the decision of the chair. So again, have that chart in front of you, trying to inform yourself of the basics so that you have an understanding of what it is that people are raising as questions as you go through the debate on a particular topic. So we've talked a bit, a bit about this on debate on the question. So I'm gonna cover this. I can't emphasize enough. When people are debating the question before the board or a committee, all remarks should proceed through the chair. We don't address the body. We don't address the, the crowd, the public that's assembled. We certainly don't address TV cameras and we don't address other supervisors, okay? We wanna direct our commentary through the chair. Now, why do we do that? Well, because there has to be some level of decorum. This is a formal meeting, okay? The taxpayers, the citizens, have put us in these seats to take care of the very important business that is proceeding with the county board. So let's treat it with the respect that it deserves. Let's direct our questions through the chair and at least once a month, because most county boards meet once a month, let's dress up a little bit and act in a formal concept, all right? Let's have that discussion in a very, very formal way so that we know exactly how we're proceeding, we know exactly how we're discussing the business, the very important business that's proceeding through the county board. We wanna avoid use of other members' names if we can. You know, and it reminds me, I dated myself the other day because I was in a discussion with some folks that were younger than me. And I recall in the late seventies, the Saturday Night Live skit involving Dan Aykroyd and Jane Curtin and how they would just lambast one another in personal attacks. Jane, you ignorant, and I'm not in fill in the blank, if you recall, uh, if you're old enough to have watched Saturday Night Live, you know exactly what I'm talking about. 
avoid that type of debate, all right? Address the questions through the chair and avoid those personal attacks on other supervisors. Duties of the chair. I asked Sarah before, what is the duty of the chair? The chair, the chair presides over the meeting, okay? The chair is the one who has the obligation to enforce those procedural rules and all of the members have ceded authority as it relates to procedural determinations to the chair. You can always question it. You can always question and over, try to overrule the ruling of the chair, but you've ceded authority to the chair. And so ultimately you have to respect the chair's decisions and allow the chair to do his or her job, all right? The chair enforces the rules related to debate, order, and decorum, reminds members to keep remarks germane to the merits of the question and things of that nature. The chair always has the opportunity to interrupt on procedural issues, not interrupt on sub substantive issues, not speak to the merits of a motion, but a chair can always interrupt and say, I remind you supervisor to please keep your comments germane to the question pending before the county board. I remind you supervisor not to direct any sort of commentary to the public. I remind you supervisor not to direct commentary to supervisor X. And so that's the chair's responsibility. Chair keeps members on track. Again, the chair, think of it as the shepherd. The shepherd is guiding this business through the county board, through the committee, okay? Um, response to requests, and, and that's an important point on the last bullet, rules on points of order. That We talked about that earlier. It's the chair's responsibility to make determinations on rules of procedure. Relinquish the chair if you're entering discussion in a substantive way. Again, I see there's merit to a chair merely saying a couple of things. If again, it's not out of character with the balance of the county board, that's okay. Because again, the chair has a constituency to represent, but if there's a particular insight, knowledge, information that the chair wants to convey, it's always best for the chair to relinquish the gavel to the vice chair to allow the chair to participate in debate. Now you'll see in the third bullet, there's an exception with small boards and committees. That's recognized in Robert's rules. I talked before about once a month, let's get together, let's be formal. Let's act in a very business-like way in dealing with a very important business before the county board. When we're dealing with a committee, typically it's you know five members. If we're in a five member meeting, you can be a lot less formal when it comes to presentation of these particular issues. And that's okay. Now, I view the role of the chair, whether it be the county board chair or the committee chair to efficiently get business before the assembly. And there are plenty of opportunities as recognized in Robert's rules for the chair to ask for things like consensus, to ask if there's any objection, to say, if there is no objection, we are gonna proceed in this fashion. And assuming that there's no objection, we're just gonna move right through that item of business, okay? Let me give you an example. Motion to approve the minutes. Uh, Mr. Chair, I see that there should be a correction in the minutes. We met on Tuesday, not Wednesday, as indicated in the minutes. Now, does the chair need to put that question to a yes or no or roll call vote before the body if it's obvious that you met on a Tuesday instead of a Wednesday? Not necessarily. The chair can say any objection to changing Wednesday to Tuesday. Hearing none, the minutes will be corrected as indicated. Any further corrections to the minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes say aye. All those opposed say no. Motion carries, minutes stand approved as corrected. All right, that's a very efficient way to get through the business before the assembly. And we should take every opportunity as a chair to really embrace those efficiencies to the extent we can, especially when we're dealing with committees and smaller entities that are getting together. In the committee, it's recognized that you can have a little bit of discussion before a motion. I still don't necessarily like that personally because I'm not certain that everybody understands what we're debating. All right, I wanna understand what is it that we are debating? So I wanna question before me, purchase 15 police cars. All right, let's debate that. Let's have a discussion about that. If we just have this vague notion about purchasing more police cars for the sheriff's office, I mean, so I'm gonna engage in a vague discussion. I think it's okay, not okay. In somebody's mind, it might be three. In somebody else's mind, it might be 30. I have no idea. I don't have a motion in front of me. So let's get a motion out there, even in a committee to understand what it is that we're debating. Um, in a committee, again, it's very informal. You can raise a hand instead of standing or pressing a button. You can remain seated during debate and discussion. Again, informal discussion under Robert's rules is permitted. You can speak as often as you like for as long as you like. It's up to the call of the chair as to when it becomes excessive. 
The committee chair has the opportunity to participate in debate without going through the formality of handing the gavel to the vice chair and stepping down and things of that nature. So again, you see that the rules of procedure as it relates to working in a committee are much different than when working with a full board. So let's talk a little bit about some of the misconceptions that we've got under Robert's rules. And these are, again, just based on my observations, counties association observations that are out there. Um, by no means are we addressing everything, but these are just some of it. Nominations. You know, nominations aren't necessary to elect somebody. You can have a nomination process, and I like the nomination process typically because it's going to show who has support. And so I want to know who, who, who has support for this. But if somebody's nominated, can I vote for somebody who's not nominated? Absolutely. I can vote for anybody that I want who's otherwise qualified for the position. So nominations aren't entirely recognized. You can nominate yourself. You don't have to wait for somebody else to nominate you. There's no second required on the nominations. And I always hear this from the chair. Are there any other nominations? Are there any other nominations? Are there any other nominations? You don't have to do that. Under Robert's rules, you're not required to ask three times. As a chair, it is your responsibility to make sure you don't have any other nominations. So I think people want to ask three times in order to ensure that there are no other nominations, but Robert's rules does not have the three question requirement in it, just so we're clear. Elections under Robert's rules. If you have three, four people that are running for two positions, and so you've got a slate of four running for two positions, you go through the first round of voting and you eliminate the lowest vote total immediately. Is that appropriate? No. It's not appropriate. Under Robert's rules, you keep voting until those two have the majority of votes necessary in order to get the position. Why? Well, because there might be need after a series of votes to elect a compromise candidate. So you don't want to remove people from the list of eligibility simply because they didn't receive enough votes on the first go round. Okay. So again, understand, and I know certain counties have certain rules as it relates to that, but under Robert's rules, you don't eliminate anybody. You keep voting until you have people who are appropriate, appropriately elected. <clears throat> Motion to lay on the table. I hear this all the time where people want to take something off of, and this again, takes the motion out of the hands of the deliberative assembly, the county board. So I want to take the motion out of the hands of the county board, and I want to take it up at the next meeting after we have more information related to the particular question before the board. That's not a motion to lay on the table. That's a motion to postpone to a definite time being the next meeting. And so if you want to take it out of the hands of the deliberative assembly, the county board, and put it back before the county board at the next meeting, you say, Mr. Chair, Madam Chair, I move that we postpone this question until the next meeting. And if it's seconded, you go through debate and you have a discussion on that. A motion to lay on the table means that we have some urgent matter. Remember, it's one thing at a time before the deliberative assembly. We have some urgent matter that we want to take care of. So we want to take care of that quickly. And then we want to get back to the debate on this original main motion. So you move to table this question pending resolution of whatever the urgency is. That's the motion to table. Again, the motion to postpone, you can postpone to a definite time. What's it mean if you postpone something indefinitely? That means you want to kill it, okay? So that's a way to kill a particular matter of business before the body without a no vote. Sometimes you want to use that so that you're not on record as voting no against a particular measure, but you certainly don't want this matter being the official business of the county board. You want to postpone it indefinitely. So just understand that the use of that motion, and this is again where the chair has the opportunity to explain to the body, if we adopt this motion to postpone indefinitely, that means that we are not doing this. It's not coming back before this particular body during this session of the county board, the two-year session. So we're going to postpone it indefinitely, which has the effect of killing the motion. We talked about calling the question. It's actually moved the previous question. It's, it's not debatable, so you don't have the opportunity to discuss the merits of continuing in debate, and it requires a two-thirds vote to take that question and that debate out of the hands of the board and put it to an immediate vote. Motion to adopt the entire report, and I see this all the time. Some particular official or employee of the county provides a report to the county board, and somebody makes a motion to accept the report. Once you accept it legally, that makes it your report as the body. So 
we don't necessarily want to do that unless we're incredibly confident that everything within that report is 100% accurate and true. And if it was 100% accurate and true in our own minds, why do we have somebody else reporting about it? And so you can acknowledge receipt of the report in the minutes, but you don't want to accept that report because you don't want the connotation out there that somehow you're 100% in agreement with it considering the nature of what's being reported on. So again, I would talk with your corporation counsel on this, but there are very important legal considerations as it re relates to receiving those reports from department heads and other officials. We went through the eight boxes before at the beginning, and I talked about whose motion it was at any particular time as we move through the eight boxes. Oftentimes, we get to the debate portion, and the maker of the motion, uh, or excuse me, somebody other than the maker of the motion will turn to the maker of the motion and say, will you accept a friendly amendment from 15 to 13 police cars? The maker of the motion says, yep. And the chair says, okay, now it's changed from 15 to 13. That's out of order. You can't do that. The motion at that point belongs to the assembly. Now, it may be that everybody on the county board floor agrees with moving to 15, 13. That's opportunity for the chair to say to the person who asked for the friendly amendment, are you making a, a motion to amend the original main motion from 15 to 13? Yes, Mr. Chair, I am. Is there a second? Second, is there any objection to making that particular amendment to the original main motion? If somebody raises an objection, then you engage in debate and you have to vote on that amendment. But if nobody objects, then the chair has opportunity to say, okay, there's no objection. So we are going to treat the original main motion as amended from 15 to 13. We will now resume debate on the original main motion, which now says the county will purchase 13 police cars for the sheriff's office, all right? So understand that there's no concept of a friendly amendment and the seconder doesn't have to okay, okay this. The, the motion belongs to the body and it's the body that controls that motion. Point of order, if at any point you have questions, you can raise those questions of procedure at any point, get recognized by the chair. Madam Chair, I have a question as it relates to parliamentary procedure or the county board rules and ask that question. If you think the board is acting contrary to Robert's rules or the county board rules, Madam Chair, point of order. All right, you can always do that. It's in order, it takes precedence over the pending question. It doesn't require a second, it's not debatable. You're asking the chair for either information or to make a ruling based upon procedure. So you can always raise that. Again, remember I talked about parliamentary procedure being a shield and not a sword. Part of that shield gives individuals the right to ask questions. So feel free to ask questions. This happens all the time with new members on the county board. They feel intimidated. They feel overwhelmed. All this stuff is proceeding. They don't understand what's happening. As a new member, you always have the opportunity to raise your hand, stand up, request point of order, request a parliamentary inquiry as it relates to the rules of procedure. So take advantage of that. We talked about appealing the ruling of the chair. Again, the chair is there to rule on matters of procedure, but ultimately it's the body that determines the procedure. So the body can always overrule the decision of the chair. And finally, this was taken from, I think it was the Rock County Board of Supervisors meeting. I'm kidding. This was the Ukrainian parliament. And this is a wonderful picture of how good meetings go bad. I don't quite understand what the guy with the water bottle turned upside down is about to do because I don't think smacking somebody with a plastic water bottle is gonna do as much damage as the guy with a closed fist, but uh, we have to stop meeting this way. Let's bring all of our rules, all of our procedures together, meet in an effective and efficient way because that's what our public demands. So now we are on the official Q&A part of the session, Sarah. I'll turn it back to you to see what kind, what kind of questions we have. All right, we have a number of questions for you, Andy. Uh, let's let's talk about how to deal with a member who is holding up the progress of a meeting because they're speaking out of turn, swearing, acting acting inappropriately during a meeting. Sarah, um, can we kick him out of the meeting? Well, Andy, <laughs> I think we can. I was going to say, I think we could. <laughs> I think we can. I think we can kick him out of a meeting, and. Realistically, if you know that a particular member is going to be obstructionist or difficult or problematic prior to a meeting, it's probably worth a conversation with your sheriff about having a sheriff's deputy at the meeting 
and that deputy can be enlisted to assist with the exit process for that particular member if he or she becomes out of order. Understand too that I would assume in that circumstance, the majority of the county board agrees with removing that member from the meeting. That's a very serious issue and I don't take it lightly, nor should you. So I think what you wanna do is give the member the opportunity to conform their conduct to norm, but if they don't wanna do that and they continue to swear and be obstructionist, then I think at that opportunity, you say, I've given you two chances or whatever the case may be to conform your conduct, you're not doing so. Sheriff's deputy, I would ask that you remove member X from the meeting and they take care of it because that person is actually engaged in conduct. Once it's determined that that person is disorderly, it's disorderly conduct under county ordinance or state statute. So the sheriff's deputy has every right to enforce removal of that particular member. Andy, what if that unruly member is the county board chair? If the That's county a great board chair interrupts, if the county board chair, uh, you know, uses character attacks, speaks repeatedly on a matter while they are still in the chair, what happens to the county board chair? How do you deal with it then? How many, how many votes are required to remove the county board chair, Sarah? Uh, is it a majority? It's a simple majority. So at that point, if everybody recognizes and agrees the board chair is acting out of order at any point in time, and again, it has to be noticed. We have open meetings law issues to deal with, but you have the opportunity to remove the board chair. And then I think in the absence of removal, you always have the opportunity to raise point of order and raise parliamentary inquiry questions and, and attempt to bring the chair back in line. All right, let's take on looking for some other questions here. We have a lot of questions that here that relate to, uh, you know, proper uh, open meetings law issues, I believe, with regard to, you know, can you a motion be made on an item that is not already on or related to the meeting agenda? No, you, you can make a motion to place something on the agenda in the absence of a board rule or local ordinance that discusses agenda procedure, but the body can always make a motion to have an item placed on the agenda for the next meeting. You can do that, but you cannot make a motion for a matter that's not been on the, not been noticed on the agenda because then that would be a violation of the open meetings law. Andy, can you talk about if a motion doesn't get a second, but debate begins, does that still constitute a second? Nope, you have to have a second. It's an official process that shows that there's support for the motion and then that motion then gets transferred to the chair for restating and the chair transfers it to the body. So think about the eight boxes. If a motion never receives a second, it dies. It dies with the maker. And so that would be opportunity for a member of the body to raise a point of order and say, Madam Chair, there was no second for this motion. This debate is out of order and ask the chair for a ruling. All right, Andy, if I'm a chair, how do I know if I need a simple majority, a two thirds vote or a three quarters vote is required? Did we post the link in the chat? We did. Take a look at the chat, follow that link. It's a nice little chart here. Keep that chart handy. Put it in a little desk drawer that is in your desk as you sit there as chair, pull it out for every meeting and then you'll know exactly what vote is necessary. And in circumstances where the statutes might require a supermajority vote, ask your corporation counsel in those circumstances, because again, that's not covered in the chart because that's Robert's rules, but there may be requirements under state statute. But as a chair, I can't stress this enough. Take your time, all right? Nobody is going to enforce a time clock on you because you are in charge of the time clock. So take your time, figure out what the vote needs to be, confer with corporation counsel, and then let the body know. I was going to just uh, mention as well, Andy, there's also a, a chart a little different than the one you posted here, but there's also a similar chart in our uh, county officials handbook as well. That's yeah, I think we I think we actually took this chart and if I remember, I think we uh, reworded it a little bit and put it in the handbook. You're right. That's a good point. Okay, since uh, given the guidance to have no discussion before a motion. Is it appropriate to have agenda items titled discussion and possible motion? It is. And again, this is where you get a little bit. It depends upon the nature of the discussion um, and the nature of the business that's proceeding before the county board. So you can technically have a discussion before the motion on a particular topic that's on the agenda. Um, but the only circumstance where I see that happening is if we're going into closed session to talk about a particular issue, because we don't. If we're gonna talk about a personnel issue, for example, we gotta know a little bit more about the issue before we make a motion to, for example, terminate a particular employee. 
So it would be inappropriate to make a motion to terminate the employee without any information indicating that I support termination. So you know what, I wanna go into closed session. I wanna hear from the department head. I wanna hear from others with information relevant to whether we're going to terminate this particular employee before I make the motion. So that's a circumstance where it would be appropriate to have some sort of discussion before we have a question pending. But again, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's an exception, definitely not a rule. And in my mind, I think that happens in closed session. Um, I can't think of other circumstances where that may happen because in open session, typically we're dealing with resolutions and the resolution is the motion. Andy, do we need a motion to adjourn? Uh, yeah, no, you don't. The chair can declare a meeting adjourned. That's another one of the efficiency pieces within Robert's rules. Uh, once you get to the ed end of the agenda, there's no other business. The chair can say, seeing no other business to come before the assembly, Absent any objection, I will declare this meeting adjourned. Any objection? Hearing none, the meeting stands adjourned. You can do that. And there is a question too about asking us to repost the chart again uh, because the link may have disappeared in the chat. We will make sure to post that chart um, along with all of the other meeting materials and the recording on the WCA website. All right, let's see here. Okay, a board passes a resolution setting a policy in January on a close vote. Can a member who's opposed to the policy keep bringing the matter back each month to try to rescind that policy? When when is it? There's some questions on you know related to session. Andy in here questions on bringing back bringing back uh, failed items. Yeah, that's getting a little bit into the weeds, and a lot of times local rules deal with this question. I'm rubbing my eyes because I'm thinking of all the circumstances that we've dealt with over the years on this particular issue. Robert's Rules recognizes, I believe it's two opportunities to redebate or reconsider, if you will, the question before the assembly. One is a motion for reconsideration. There are rules associated with motions to reconsider. A person who's on the winning side has to make the motion to reconsider. And then you have to, it requires a supermajority vote to get back before the body, but it's not appropriate to reconsider a motion if the body has already taken action in reliance upon the original motion that is going to be reconsidered. So there are technical rules associated with a reconsideration motion. There is also a motion to rescind action previously taken, and that again has some technical requires, uh, requirements on rescission. Those are the two ways that you get a question that has previously been adopted or disposed of back before the assembly. There is no opportunity for somebody to continuously keep bringing a matter before the assembly that the assembly has already disposed of. And I think it's incumbent upon the chair at that point in time to say, we've already dealt with this question. We're not going to deal with it again. It's out of order. There is a mechanism for you if you wanna bring it back before the assembly. I encourage you to take a look at Robert's rules and confer with corporation council about how to get that done. All right, Andy, there's a question with regard to tabling. An item comes up on an agenda, uh, motion and second to table the item, uh, majority carried, then there was no discussion because the item was tabled. Is it correct that there's no discussion or debate on tabling? Well, if you look at the chart, a motion to lay on the table is, I'm trying to figure out exactly where it is. It's, it's on the second page of the chart. Well, I've got it printed here. So I'm, you, you wanna to move to table a particular time and, and lay it on the table so you can take up other business. It requires a second, there's no debate, you cannot amend that, and it requires a majority vote, all right? And again, that's right here on the chart. So you go across and you figure out exactly how that works. And again, the chart lays all of that out for you. And in Andy, in that particular instance, uh, but it was the motion to table appropriate if the motion was to, to kill the item. No, no, then you indefinitely postpone. It's out of order. The reason that you want to lay something on the table is to take up an urgent or emergency circumstance. And so it would be inappropriate to try to kill it by moving to lay it on the table. All right, we'll take one more question here. Um, Andy, can a sergeant at arms be appointed for a particular meeting? Sure. I think that the chair has the opportunity to appoint a sergeant at arms, but who does the sergeant of arms belong to, so to speak? It's the body. 
And so let's say in the absence of a board rule or a local ordinance that discusses the position of sergeant at arms, I think the chair at the beginning of the, of the meeting has the opportunity to say to the body, um, ladies and gentlemen, I plan on appointing Supervisor Diedrich Kasdorf as Sergeant at Arms to assist in procedural issues associated with this meeting. Is there any objection to Supervisor Diedrich Kasdorf being appointed Sergeant at Arms? Hearing none, she is so appointed for purposes of this meeting. You can do it that way. The other way is that you can ask for nominations. You can go through a vote. You can do all of that, but understand that in a way to try to create efficiency and expediency, I would suggest that the chair move knowing that there, if the chair understands there's not going to be significant objection from the body. And Sarah is very happy to be Sergeant at Arms. She, in fact, she said to me, she would like nothing better than to drive around the state and enforce rules. That's me, Andy, you know it, you know it. So I'm looking at the remainder of the questions here. There are a number of questions related to conflicts of interest, uh, questions related to public comments, questions related to items, you know, being placed on agendas, committee of the whole, all of that. We are already 10 minutes past our uh, scheduled closing time. Um, so we won't have time to get to the remainder of the questions. But again, for those of you who still have questions, you can always reach out to uh, folks here at the WCA office. We are happy to get answers to questions for you, whether we know the answer ourselves or whether or not we have to consult today's expert with regard to your particular question, we would always be sure to get an answer back to you. Um, so with that, I don't know, Andy, if you have any closing comments, yeah, very quickly. I understand there are a lot of intricacies associated with parliamentary procedure and rules of procedure as it relates to particular county boards, and nobody does it the same, and that's okay. I'd be happy if the association is interested and everybody else is interested to have another town hall style webinar where you just get to ask questions. I can give you my thoughts, Sarah can give you her thoughts, um, because that's what it is. Ultimately, it's up to the chair and the parliamentarian, the corporation council to interpret and apply your particular rules. But we'd certainly be happy to give you thoughts on some of these complex questions. So if you think that would be of interest, feel free to reach out to Sarah and say, yeah, let's have, a, let's just have an open discussion on Parley Pro, and maybe we can take some of these and dive into some of the details on some of these. As Sarah indicated, I'm a geek like Sarah. I kind of like this stuff. It's kind of fun. So whatever we can do to give you the tools necessary to make it a more efficient meeting, that's that's our goal. Andy, we're getting lots of uh, lots of uh, uh, you know chatter here in this chat box of folks saying that'd be a great idea. Can we have more training on this? Let's have a town hall meeting. Thanks, Andy. You've now obligated me to uh, to work on uh, putting together additional training, which I am happy to do. As Andy said, I actually enjoy this topic. It's a little outside the realm of what I typically do during my day, and I think Andy sometimes we think it's fun. It is fun. Kind I of agree. Delve into this and figure out what is the the proper answer and proper procedure. So, I will I will commit today on on video to putting together some additional uh, training sessions for us on this topic. Um, you know, maybe we can do it at a time when we can all get together in person, and we'll be able to spend a lot more time together in Stevens Point. Uh, being able to answer a lot of questions specifically related to par parliamentary procedure or some of the related topics too with regard to agendas and minutes so in open meetings law they all kind of intertwine here with some of this stuff so be happy to put something like that together for you but otherwise i think we are out of time andy thank you so much for your time today and thank all of you for joining us and for all of your wonderful questions Again, if you have additional questions that didn't get answered today, please feel free to reach out to Andy or one of us at the WCA office, and we'd be more than happy to get an answer uh, for you. Otherwise, with that, thank you guys so much and have a great uh, Monday and rest of your week. Thank you all.